You're listening to the Back Home Network, presented by Homefield Apparel. So what the games, physical basketball I was at the game, you were there. You, you watched it on my YouTube. Anyway. I saw okay. the game. Yeah, I watched the game. I watched the game. I watched the game. Well, we're here. I'm Bob Motes. Welcome to X's and Joe's, a podcast dedicated to decoding the winning formula in college basketball. And I'm Mike Weemouth, also known as IU in Philly. So, Bob, um, they gave us a podcast. Yeah. You know, the wisdom of this is yet to be seen. But uh, I, at some point, because we've been doing this the way we've been doing this so long, I keep expecting Perky to be walking by one of us or both of us with um Coca-Colas and coffee ready to go here at the uh, at the old now defunct Bloomington Denny's. <laughs> yeah, it's like a yeah, it's great to be able to relive um our our better years in the 90s, you know, um through uh modern technology like this. So, <laughs> yeah. Agreed. We Agreed. miss we we dearly miss uh, departed old Perky and the uh and the Bloomington Denny's. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh well, maybe to uh sort of introduce what we're trying to do here with this pod, maybe we'll give a brief explainer on what this thing, we hope this thing is going to be about. Um, Bob and I, we've been friends for about well, maybe 27 years or so, and we've maintained this ongoing, generally never-ending conversation about college basketball. Um, we'll be taking more of a 30,000-foot view of the game in terms of where it's been, where we think it is, and where we believe it is also going. Um, we'll hope to challenge some long-standing myths and assumptions using data and, you know, in some cases, our own experience, while occasionally tolerating our uh, forays into old music and historical references, particularly of the uh, military variety. And and really, you know, Mike, over the years, I think we both have kind of shied away from the whole game-by-game -game hot take sort of culture where we're talking about recruiting battles, blow-by-blow, blow, who's got who's doing what, when, where, and how. Um, we, we try not to do cliches, and when we do them, we usually use them as sarcasm. And we don't pretend to know everything. In fact, we're still learning. We're still trying to figure this out. It's an ongoing process in figuring it out. And if there's something we just, that, we, that we're saying that you're like, what, what are you even, where are you even coming from with that? Let us know because we're both married. We both have kids. We're conditioned to receive feedback from others and, 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 to, and to pay attention to it. So. Uh, before we dig in, let's talk a little bit about home field apparel. So, Mike, you got your Christmas shopping done? Yeah, mostly, yeah. So, let me what we what we did this year for my brother in law's family out in New Jersey. Uh, they're all Ohio University folks. Um, he and his wife uh, met out there. Both of their daughters, my nieces, are attending school there. Their son's a big fan, also. And we figured out you know, looking at home field, that they have really good vintage Ohio University uh, stuff, as well as just about any any campus, most of the campuses that you can think of where you might have somebody that you love and care about or someone that you just don't know how to shop for necessarily at that point and figure out to give them something new, new and unique. Um, and we figure that once they start wearing those around campus, they're going to be great conversation starters in the Athens, Ohio area, just because they are so different as well as being very comfortable and, and good to wear. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, our, our mutual buddy, Bo Haynes, you know, AKA Nola Hoosier, he first turned me on to home field a few years ago. And um, yeah, I was blown away by all the crazy selection they've got. I mean, as a Terre Haute native, I was particularly floored by the Indiana State University merchandise, particularly all that like powder blue 1979 Larry Bird, you know, um, team merchandise from that final four squad um that being that team being like my first basketball memories um you know as like a four-year-old i mean it's um anything you find in home field you feel like it's uh, just a walk down memory lane i could literally feel myself back in the old holman center and seeing that old tartan turf um gum eraser uh basketball floor that used to play on that uh 
<laughs> that you, I was amazed that you know you didn't have like ten ACL tears a game of that thing, but oh. um, but yeah, but the just the memories that uh, home field kind of like instills in you with uh, just the crazy selection of uh, stuff that is sometimes goes back like literally forty years um, to mm -hmm. some of the old teams is just great. So so I think for basketball nerds like us that's mm -hmm. the ultimate sort of like, you know, one-stop shopping place to, uh, to find some really good stuff uh, for the holidays. I mean, that, that t-shirt you're talking about from Indiana state, my, I got that for my mom for her birthday last year. Oh yeah. They uh, went there, right. My parents met at Indiana state and yeah. uh, Terre Haute's a special place for them. And those are my first memories too, except you got to go to the Holman center. I watched it on like a 16 inch colored <laughs> TV without was, a remote control. It's probably fuzzy too, right? <laughs> uh, we got really good signal on those network games, uh, yeah. but it was at that, that was a time where you didn't really see much on network either, but sure. you know, as uh, you know, but again, so um, just again, it, Home fields are just a just a great place to 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 look for merchandise, and it comes with a story as well as just again um, just high quality materials and birth I believe from the Kelly School of Business. Yep, exactly. Yeah, people should go out and check it out. Homefieldapparel dot com. So in the you know in the in 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 the in, in the honor of the IU Circle logo, which will be setting our story a little bit. This is episode one. Dudes with acuity or a disciplined approach, which matters more? Mike, do you remember when we launched that question really for the first time? I uh, guess. Oh, yeah. The um, Would that be the, the infamous Kentucky game? That would be where you showed up at this apartment that I lived in on 7th and Washington in this little L-shaped building. It's still there. Everything else seems to be gone. The laundromat across the street. Mm -hmm. um, the parking lot, which is now Yogi's, that's on the other caddy corner on the other side. I think the phone company is still there, but a lot of the uh, old houses has been torn down and turned into condos. And this little L-shaped apartment with five, you know, five of them on top, or building 1960s horrible architecture, just, just this little, this this little building. And um, it looked like something out of a horror movie set. It, it really did. It really did. But it had great access. I could hear. I could hear the bluebird from my bathroom. So it was, that's it was true. A, yeah. You talk about the greatest college apartment. I think I had it. Yeah. Um, and we kept it in the family, so to speak, for about six years. Yeah. But um, it was December seventh, nineteen ninety six, a date which will live in infamy uh, for IU fans, <laughs> because that was that was not. I mean, we just got through the Auburn game. That wasn't really the result we were looking for. Yeah, it's um, yeah, and um, saying it's the date shall shall live in it for me. It was ironically on December seventh, so it, it was, was Pearl December. Harbor Day. And yeah, the, the the game itself, the the slaughter by Kentucky in the nineteen ninety six uh, IU Kentucky game was um, was very Pearl Harbor like. Um, it, it would be like if Pearl Harbor plus if the Enterprise in Saratoga hadn't been out on maneuvers and got sunk too. It was that in the basketball sense, it was that much of a beatdown. Uh, if you recall that, I mean that that, that there was. I mean, it wasn't the week before was when IU beat Duke for the preseason NIT. Yes, exactly. Yeah, little little context setting. You know, this is ninety six, ninety seven. It's like what two years after, you know, two or three years after uh, Cheney, uh, that core of the Cheney team had kind of left. You know, from yeah. the from the Final Four um, squad. Um, yeah, the, those two preceding years were like. Uh, Two prior, yeah, the two priors they had what 24 total losses. Um, I think that, yeah, two first round uh NCAA tournament exits, and yeah, the week before this Kentucky game, IU beats Duke, um, in the preseason IT. Not the best Duke team, um, no. but still Duke nonetheless, and still the preseason IT nonetheless. Well, and 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 at that point, I mean, both in like Indiana, North Carolina, Duke. There were, you know, Duke had just come off a couple of years earlier that that you know the the that horrible season where they I think they were sub five hundred and Shashevsky got his back surgery. That's right. Yeah. And all three programs were seeming to we, we I think they have been all three programs in some way it seemed to be down a little bit. Yeah. And, yeah, and then, yeah, and yeah. I, I, I and I remember just the, the the fan base just being like totally on fire that like whole week yeah. i remember like people had their i mean they literally doing the superman thing like pulling their you know we're back shirts on and uh you know and saying well the the train is back on the track and you know i was um 
people are looking up like, okay, can I get some Final Four tickets, you know, and get the hotels reserved now? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I drove down to uh, Louisville for the game. Um, regretted it pretty quickly. Um, the final score was 99-65. UK just boat raced IU, like, literally from start to finish. Uh, the talent athleticism gap in the game was utterly ridiculous. UK was, like, running out breaks just constantly. Um, yeah, I, I left literally with like seven minutes still left in the game. I remember specifically, and you can look at this on uh, Galen Clavio's uh, YouTube site, just, you know, put in like Kentucky, Indiana, 1996. And uh, if you really want to like, you know, abuse yourself in watching, uh, watching that game. Um, Derek Anderson had a, 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 a a slam dunk, um, a poster slam on Andre Patterson. That is UK's starting two guard, posterizing IU's um, power forward. And after he did, he did like this little shimmy dance, I remember, and literally like about maybe a fourth of the IU, um, um, I guess the yeah, the crowd or the, uh, the attendees on the IU side just said, okay, we're not going to like stay for this humiliation. So, so I bolted out of there and... I also got out of there just because at that time I always felt like the uh, the Louisville Athletic Department always seemed to screw with the IU and Kentucky fans. At least it seemed on parking. They always seemed like they always seemed to have maybe two parking uh, exits made available for all eighteen thousand attendees. So it was always a nightmare trying to get out of that place. It felt like Woodstock, you know, from <laughs> down in the bluegrass state. So yeah, I got out of there, fired up. Um, 65 and I was in your apartment about what, like 11 o'clock? About, about 11. And realized that I was sitting there with a bunch of, you know, a bunch of our friends watching the game on a 24 inch TV and just absolutely shell shocked. Yeah. I mean, we looked at you like, wait, how'd yeah. you get out of there alive? Yeah, no, it was, uh, yeah literally it was <laughs> I like, mean, I was, I was George Pickett, like returning from, uh, from Gettysburg. It's like, ugh. You, and, you made and, it. <laughs> and I mean, that, that that was a year where I was in a position where I might have been able to get really good Final Four tickets. Definitely things I wouldn't have imagined getting True. as a kid growing up watching Cowboy Bob on Channel 4. As student body president as you were at the time. I was sitting on athletics committee. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, we, we, you know, and, and so I'm just watching my, you know, watching this, my dreams kind of getting shattered there of like this, <laughs> maybe, maybe we, maybe we aren't who we thought we were. Yeah. And that was the start of the conversation, right? Like this conversation, it's literally, that was like, uh, or this is the orange origin story, like day one. It, it is. And, and really it was the question that you posed to me when I was like, how is this even possible? Mm-hmm. How is it that after, and again, we're talking at our point, 20, 21 years of life, you know, mm-hmm. where it's always been a certain way that it for the first time felt like it wasn't true, that it yeah. wasn't, it wasn't something you could just bank on. Mm. And you asked that, you know, and then you asked me a question back of saying, well, Bob, what, what the issue, you know, what, what do you think happened here tonight? And I said, well, they're just, and you remember my answer. Do you actually remember my answer from that night? Yeah. I think it was something like, uh, was it uh, discipline? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and focus just weren't there. I mean, if we had discipline and focus, we could have, I mean, they're just not running the stuff the way it's being taught and the way it Mm -hmm. should be done. Yeah, and you, 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 you hit, you, you, and then you hit the nail on the head, and you said, "Bob, look at those two teams. Yeah, look at the athleticism, look at the length, look at the basketball skill. Yeah, look at the fact." And and at that point, I think I said, probably for the last time, well, who cares if they're ranked? What's this ranking stuff? Yeah, yeah, and, and to and to kind of circle back to what I was doing at the time, right around the time of that game, I w- did start to get really interested in um, sort of like basketball early basketball metrics i mean just doing basic stats you know like when i was a kid i always did that but i was kind of fascinated by um sort of like some of the early recruiting stuff i mean there was not nearly the sort of sites you have available today like you know 24 7 rivals and right. on three and all that what i had available to me was uh, prep stars recruiters handbook and uh, hoop scoop which hoop scoop is actually started by an iu grad named clark francis but you got a you got a magazine and you got like a an early um online you know like access login and you got just the top 100 recruits and that was it so 
So nothing like what you have today with all the, you know, not just the stars, but, you know, these, um, these ratings right down to like, you know, decimal points, you know, for each player's like, you know, power capacity and all that. So that's why I had available to me. And I actually did start to do some like number pulls on that, especially around this time. And I remember like even going to that game thinking, you know, looking at some of the guys that Kentucky has and IU has, they look like there's a little bit more uh, stacked than IU. And, and actually I'll pull this up just yeah. to, um, so, so people can see this is uh this is the like core like top eight or nine players from like each team in terms of like productivity as you can see i put in both their um their rankings if they had a top you know 100 ranking and whether they went to the nba or not as you can tell was just from the the split here Kentucky had, uh, let's say, like eight top 80 recruits. IU had four. So IU was already like, you know, at a two to one disadvantage. UK had um, seven NBA players and IU had three. So more than a two to one disadvantage in that. So, and what I was noticing at the time, not just between in this game, but looking at other teams and look and comparing the the rankings to national championships final fours winning percentages that there was this like insanely strong co correlation that existed between the rankings that teams had whether the players went to the nba and their you know ultimate performance well and you were looking at teams like arkansas at that time also as well yeah I think. Yeah, like and, basically all, all the team, like, and yeah, that was the thing. Like, not only were the rankings valid, but you could tell when teams changed in their uh, rankings composition, when it like went up and down, their performance yeah. on the court would also basically follow along with that, uh, with those ranking changes. So, yeah, I think with like um, Arkansas, well, Richardson was hired about like 85. They didn't have like a lot of great recruits sort of in like that 84, 85, 86. Then recruiting spikes in 87 with Todd Day, Lee Mayberry, and they go from 12 years, there's 12 wins in year one to I think 30 wins and by year five. And you see that yeah. recurrent pattern all like so many of the other programs at that time, just like, you know, recruiting spikes, winning spikes, recruiting dives and, um, and the encore, you know, basically they're, they're losing spikes. And unfortunately, IU in this case was one of the, the cases that was going the other direction. IU clearly had like lost a big step from where they had uh, in sort of like the, and, the, Ch the Cheney and Henderson years. And I think that as you went through the initial findings, you know, this was a time which Indiana basketball, things were changing in the high school game. Um, I live in Columbus, so I mean, we talk about Bill Stearman. His generation of coaches were getting out, mm -hmm. and we were beginning. We were thinking, well, there there really weren't a whole lot of impact players mm -hmm. that were coming out of the state. Between you know, take between maybe Brian Evans and and that's his. You know, considering Sharon Wilkerson was in, was, was, I would say between Sharon Wilkerson and then basically that you know Luke Recker. There really wasn't that, you know, those, those years where you had, you know, those types of players coming out of the state, yeah. even singularly, let alone in, in in bunches. And I think at that time also there was this, the, the you know, this idea that we were living under kind of a mythology that Indiana University didn't necessarily need top of the line talent, mm -hmm. that it didn't need and that and that really just kind of put teams together. And they could find a way to compete as long as you followed the system, as long as you played Coach Knight's way of basketball, that a that a that a team full of kids could, you know, that 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 had some skill, had some athleticism, but if they were, you know, because they're doing things a certain way, they're going to be successful. Yeah. And it doesn't account for the fact that other systems work too. It doesn't account for the fact that the talent is a little different, that, that differentiating by talent in certain ways can sometimes put you at a, at a material disadvantage. And even though a lot of this can be true at the same time, it was also one where I think at the end, you know, as we looked at this game in particular, you know, you could, you could make that myth or that kind of that, that assumption. Well, there's not a whole lot of, there are Indiana or Midwestern players on that list. Yeah, as many as you would see in the past, and therefore that could explain it. But there was other explanations too that we were looking at that time. 
Exactly. Yeah. Before we go to a quick break here, I wanted to show um, the sort of comparison to just like four years prior. So you look at this. Um, this is the 92 Final Four match between uh, IU and Duke. You can see, you know, whereas in the prior slide in Kentucky in 96, I used basically a two to one disadvantage in terms of some of those metrics I said that were like pretty predictive of, you know, winning, um, you know, totals of NBA, you know, future NBA players and, you know, um, numbers of players ranked, you know, in at least in the top, you know, say five and 80. In this slide, you see like Duke has seven top 80 players. IU has seven top 80 players. Duke has six NBA guys and IU has five NBA guys. So, so this is the demonstration, you know, compared to where IU was in 92 and 96. Basically, the talent that IU had on hand was cut in half. So, and when you're talking about, you know, how competitive you, you know, all the games that were back then, you know, for trying to, you know, win out, you know, against a team like a Duke in Kentucky, especially with the kind of coaching they already had. It was very difficult, even for a uh, Hall of Fame top three coach all time like Bob Knight, to be able to just make up all of um, that gap just through like trying to scheming and coaching, you know, and um, well, just doing like any sort of like uh, you know in game, you know, uh, changes and alterations. So it's, well, uh, and when you consider the fact that he missed only one tournament in the '64 team era while he was at IU, and it was the first year of the '64 team era. That tells you just how how good of a job he was still doing, even at the end of trying to get these guys to play together in a certain way and be able to at least get a tournament resume together during that time. Yeah. All right. And Com coming so, up, so coming up on X's and Joes, we'll um, we'll talk a little about the um, the, the Hoosier uh, mythology, and so stay tuned here on the Back Home Network. So, the Hoosiers mythos. The movie is not a documentary, Mike. We've said that a million times, right? <laughs> it, it, and 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 it's a great story and one that we should all all follow. But a, a lot of it comes into just I think that there's a lot of that sort of mindset that we've had over the last few years that we were talking about at the at the outset of the last segment was that mythology kind of still permeates throughout the program, don't you know and. Yeah, as we've as we've kind of gone through this over the years, interacting with folks. Yeah, you know, it's it, it is kind of interesting. You know, I when we talk, you know, so many of the people that we know um, personally that are basketball fans, how many of them treat basketball almost like it's a a secondary religion? Mm -hmm. And so, even amongst our almost some of our friends, like we know the ones that have an almost Jesuit like devotion to the motion offense and man to man defense. It's so, you know, there's just that, you know, that personal investment that like emotional like tie that they have to sort of like the, the way the game that used to be played when uh, you know, when they remember Indiana being, you know, in the Bobby Knight era, when it was like, you know, achieving, you know, all the, uh, all the heights that, uh, that you got in that time. So yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it is sort of the um, a kind of nostalgia, I guess. You know, it's um, you know this is the way the game is supposed to be played, and obviously, it's a it's a problem in a sport that is as dynamic as basketball is. It's constantly changing. It's what is true now in 2023. The things that seem modern now, in another 10 years, they'll be outmoded, and the things that were going on in 2013 many of those things have already like uh, gone by the wayside. So, yeah, I think the challenge I've always had is trying to get, f you know, get fans sort of like acclimated to the idea that um, there are certain distinctions that exist between the elite teams and sort of everyone else. It's not just the talent. I mean, obviously like you can do the rankings and things like that. I mean, those are great statistical measures and things like that. And they're great, you know, for like doing kind of like diagnostic work and showing like, okay, we can actually measure this. We can actually show you, okay, you're here and you want to be here, but your recruiting is like, you know, is like this far away from actually delivering exactly what you want. And so I think getting fans sort of used to the idea that, you know, it's, 
that there is more to the game than just sort of like playing it the way that you want to. It's always one of the key questions I ask fans when they say, well, we should be doing, um, we should be playing, you know, this kind of offense or running these kind of sets. I will typically ask them, do you believe that because you actually think it will deliver a specific positive result? Or is that just the kind of offense you personally prefer to see in a basketball game? That's what you personally like to watch on the TV um, you know, in your basketball viewing. So, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, it's it's interesting that kind of mythos of like Hoosiers and of uh, um, literally from the movie, just like a team coming together, overcoming the odds, playing as a team can basically overcome any sort of like talent differential. And and I think, you know, as you've kind of looked at these teams, I mean, again, it, exactly. It's and, and these aren't mutually exclusive. You know, you can bring and you bring talent, highly talented players together you put them in a system Mm -hmm. and that's, you know, that's an element of a winning program. And as you've looked at programs since that time, we were in blooming together since the late nineties. And as we've kind of gone through this, you know, and I think some would even call it the IU and Philly method or the IU and Philly formula. Mm -hmm. Um, I I know I've, I've seen it (laughs) and, and, and it's, 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 it's remarkable how Excel has just really aggregated this uh, paradigm, but it's also the thing of, as you've looked at some of these teams, you know, what are you finding, you know, what, what are you finding as the games continue to evolve? Yeah. I mean, you know, back then I would say it, it was pretty cut and dry. I mean, basically the teams that just had the most top recruits, um, you know, all the way up to like, you know, uh, literally number one, uh, you know, top 10, top 20 recruits, anyone that had those guys, you know, were probably going to win or had the most, let me say, most likely chance of uh, competing for winning the national championship. And my, I'll give my usual disclaimer about the rankings. Um, they're not perfect. Um, I usually look at them in aggregate. I don't, I don't think I've ever actually said the, um, that any particular team should not re- recruit a kid because they're ranked X and they should be ranked Y. Um the rankings are like a computer forecast, you know, for meteorology. They're generally right. They will be wrong sometimes. And of course, you know, in doing all the work that I've done over the years, I'm fully aware of exactly where these uh, these rankings can be wrong. But in aggregate, over time, they are very, very accurate, especially if you're talking about, you know, whole teams, Um over, let's say, the course of, you know, five and 10 years. So the teams like, you know, the Carolinas, the Dukes, you know, teams, uh, you know, the Michigan States, Villanovas, you know, what have you, what they're doing with recruiting is not guaranteeing outcomes. Um, You can be the best recruiting program in the world and you can get some bad, quote, unquote, bad batch of, you know, five stars occasionally. So it's, um, so it, again, it it is subject to other factors, but obviously recruiting and talent is a very, very, very heavy factor in determining the outcomes of of games. So with that said, um, yeah, to answer your question directly. Um, probably what's changed a little bit um, compared to prior years, um, let's say going back to like the early two thousands, is because of the one and done and the propensity of a lot of the top kids to not stay for multiple years, you do have this, um, this change in the composition of a lot of the better national championship teams. Um, I do have this, uh, this concept called the sweet spot, which Mm -hmm. basically accounts for the idea that teams that recruit a lot of the, top end kids and what i mean my mean by that i mean literally like you know the top 20 kids they they experience the risk of kids leaving early leaving after let's say one year um right i would say that you know duke and kentucky are probably the most prone to this um well they're well they're, well, they're built that way i mean exactly intentionally and, yeah intentionally i mean john calipari goes to kentucky and says this is what i'm going to do yeah and i think i can guarantee and I, he said at the time, I think we can guarantee these results. Exactly. Yeah. And and just to pop this up here, you know, that these are like the last two NCAA title squads that, you know, both Duke and Kentucky, Duke and Kentucky had. And, and you can tell like just how they're sort of laid out. There's just a lot of freshman talent here. You see, like yeah. Kentucky has, you know, seven of their top eight are freshmen or sophomore. You know, most all of them are like in their top thirties and they have seven NBA kids, you know, the Duke side a little bit, more experience. They have five of seven, 
five of the top seven kids are freshmen or sophomores. Um, um, they're a little bit more like distributed in terms of their experience and they have, you know, seven, uh, seven NBA kids. So th this is kind of like the one extreme end of, of the continuum in terms of like what championship teams have looked like. Um, what you're starting to see a little bit more is what, again, I call the sweet spot recruiting uh, method, which is what you see a little bit more with like say Florida and Villanova. With these teams, this is like the other end of the continuum in terms of national championship winners. Um, so whereas right. Kentucky and Duke had very heavy emphasis on freshman and sophomore um, talent, what you see with um, Florida and Villanova in this case is you have much more heavy emphasis on juniors and seniors. Um, with like Florida, like, you know, their top six are all juniors and seniors. And this yeah. Nova example for the top five are, are juniors and seniors. So, and their spread in terms of their talent is not, you don't have nearly as many, let's say like top 20 kids as the Kentucky and Duke teams had. You have a much more, um, a little bit more of a spread down into say the thirties and forties and fifties. And that's where I typically say the sweet spot generally resides, but is not exclusive to those areas. Sweet spot kids, if you want to like have a baseline definition, is that kids that are good enough to go to the NBA, but they just don't go after one year. They stay longer, typically at least till they're sophomores and juniors. So they kind of hit that other upper tip of the uh, development curve that you right. typically see with all players. And so you get basically a kid that's an NBA caliber player with experience. And these are the kind of kids that you see winning national championships. This is where the Kyle guys of the world exist. The right. Ryan Archie Diakonos, um, Ochefu Yogi from Villanova, Yogi Ferrell. Would be Yogi Ferrell. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so what my observation has been is like in the last, you know, like 10 years or so, this phenomenon has kind of like popped up where there's actually a price being paid by some of these, um, some of these top end programs investing too heavily in the, uh, in the one and done kids. And whereas teams like, you know, Florida, Villanova, um, Baylor kind of did that a little bit through the portal, um, you know, getting some more experienced, you know, players. You UConn, I even argue Kansas would be another yeah. program that has actually found that high end, exactly. but yet guys are going to stick around for a period of time. And so either way, you know, you sit in that barber shop that we talk about all the time, the barber shop from Hoosiers. <laughs> yeah. And 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 there's this this constant debate about this, about this whole idea of, well, you know, we just need to get good 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 decent players and and kind of produce doing this right now to a certain degree they maybe absolutely they'll they'll excel in one area and be incredibly good in one area but may have deficiencies in others mm -hmm. whereas you have the other side of this which is swinging by going talent 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 we need guys dudes that can play mm -hmm. and it goes back to that whole dudes with acuity you know versus the disciplined approach and so how you know, how do you convince people that a lot of this does come down to this isn't a one time thing? This isn't this is a culture, a, a culture and a program thing. And how do you get fans? And, and again, the question I think we have is how do we convince the barbershop, you know, that there's a middle road to this and that the successful programs have found it? Yeah, it's it's been hard. I mean, when I the funny thing is, when we we're talking about like going back to 96, I first started going on the earliest version of Pigs. I think I had a different handle at that time. And I was presenting some of this like early data and I would say like the opinion back then was more split. Like some people like would immediately like recognize like, Oh yeah, that kind of makes sense. And yeah, we're kind of, we, we presented this way. We kind of see the same thing. We see all the teams that are doing like, you know, recruiting a certain way seem to be winning more championships and the teams that are kind of like maybe not recruiting as well, like um, by the metrics are kind of, falling behind but i do remember like the ones that held out were definitely sort of like the bar the uh the hickory barbershop <laughs> and i i remember like whether it's live or even online it, it reminds me of that you remember that scene from moneyball where mm -hmm. jonah hill wanders into the <laughs> scout room for the first time he gets on he, base <laughs> exactly it's on base it's all those grizzled old scouts. You know, they look like they're on their second divorce and third pack of marbles at the time. 
which many of them were. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and he, yeah, he's just shooting down all their ideas. It's like, oh, well, this guy's got a great pop on the bat and all that. And, you know, he's like, well, my, my numbers say that, you know, he doesn't get on base. And yeah, the reaction I got was kind of like that from the movie. It's like, who let this nerd in here? It's like, you know, basketball is won by men, you know, on the court, not by a bunch of spreadsheets, you know, on a computer. So, yeah. So the, the initial, the initial feedback was not positive. I like, yeah. put it that way. Even with, I mean, even within our friend group, I mean, like, I, I think with just socially oh. going out to the bars, you know, and talking about this stuff was a little fraught. If you remember, look, it, it took me at least a decade to really fully buy into this. And there are some mornings I wake up and go in, are we, am I sure this guy's right? And only because it, you're, you're, you're going into something primal with me that's saying, well, Bob Knight and Chuck Marlowe told me about this in 1990, in 1987. And I, and it really isn't true. They weren't saying this, but in my DNA, and I think a lot of folks feel that way. I know it's true because yeah. year after year after year, we see it. Yeah. No, and it, it's, I, I think that's what kind of helped a little bit. I mean, yeah, I mean, at the time I remember, um, yeah, talking about this stuff from at, let's say, Kilroy's did not help my social credit score amongst our friends. Mm -hmm. I get it. I know. I, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I remember, like, this is just, like, advice to <laughs> others, like, you know, if you're ever around your friends and everyone's saying, hey, I think we can go to the Final Four Elite Eight, don't pop in there with, well, it looks like we're about 20 and 10 and about a nine seed. <laughs> very, very quickly, like, your friend's going to say, yeah, maybe next time don't invite him if we're going to have a basketball conversation. Now, you can hop on Pigs inside the hall. Assembly calls, great community as well. Or, yeah. uh, you know, there are discords you can join in these. I mean, whatever. Or just get a private handle on Twitter with a number in it and, and do that and just yeah. be like, well, it doesn't really look like I use going to be that way. And yeah. I'm sure it's, it's, yeah, it's a much different, much different social media and communication environment than it was in 96. So much different. Yeah. So anyway, we should probably take a minute. break. And um, I think we're going to come back and we're going to talk. We've talked about the X's of uh, the, uh, the Jimmy's and Joe's side. Let's maybe talk a little bit more about the X's and O's um, after we come back from a break. All right, welcome back to X's and Joe's. I'm Mike Weymouth, joined by Coach Bob Motes. So we just uh, finished talking about the uh, the Jimmy's and Joe's side of the uh, the basketball success equation. Let's examine the um, the coaching side. So Bob, while I was locked away in uh, like a hermit in some IU computer lab, the one over by the the pool hall in the in the IMU, <laughs> tell me, like at that time, like you were starting to get really interested in coaching and coaching theories. Like what, yeah. what sort of books and what sort of uh, coaches were you starting to follow at that time and some of the lessons that you were learning then? So when I, I got out of IU, I came back to Columbus and I started working at a boys and girls club in the foundation for youth here. And I picked up a, 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 a fifth, sixth grade basketball team and had a great time doing it and just began start. I started studying the game, studying different offense, defense, what, where the game was going started getting into elementary um, basketball as well. So we have a school elementary league that I've been coaching in now for well, I mean, 24, 23, 24 years and doing travel ball as well. So I would tra travel all over the state with, you know, just kind of coaching, coaching kids from this area. And you, you know, when you're in a certain situation where talent, where, you know, you can compete but there are sometimes you, especially when you're playing open teams from the Indianapolis area, or Louisville area, or mm -hmm. St. Louis, Missouri, coming over uh, and playing with their youth teams. That well, this this game when you when you're driving on the way home and you're saying we could have won it, had some things broken away, but eight out of ten times, the talent that they had, they were ten points, twenty points better. And did mm -hmm. we hit our certain? Did we hit our our, our benchmarks? Mm -hmm. And but the other backtrack is there have been some times where, you, where, we, where we've been able to win games um, where because we did things a certain way and because we had certain skill sets and certain players that could be at that level, that the talent, you know, we could, we could, out, we could mitigate the talent. And mm -hmm. as, I looked at, as I look at college basketball, there was one year that really kind of just jumped out at me as, and this is one of the, the great things that, Mike, you've had to deal with over the years, the, um, the, the Wisconsin Badgers. Okay. But Wisconsin. And, 
but Wisconsin. <laughs> and it's almost, and yeah, it's a running joke between the two of us, like, but Wisconsin. Yeah, it's um, a drinking game between us. It really is. It really yeah. can be, yeah. yeah. Just, uh, just, for, just for the, the, the audience, like, it, anytime anyone, the most frequent um, rebuttal I get, and, and Bob knows this, to any sort of conversation about recruiting and the correlation uh, to success is, well, what about Wisconsin? And which is true, Wisconsin, I can tell you, is probably the one school that just completely defies gravity in terms of uh, of how much of an outlier they are in terms of how they overachieve and truly like have a system that, you know, creates um, success um, at a level that was seems completely um, untethered to their actual talent. So um, but yeah, I've. I've jokingly turn butt wisconsin to a drinking game so um so anytime yeah. anyone says that i literally yeah. like say you take a drink <laughs> so so from dick bennett to bo ryan to greg guard you yep. know you you've seen this sort of mind you know this sort of the the this sort of thing kind of going that 2014 2015 time frame for ryan which was, i think 2015 was his last season coaching full season yeah, coaching about the, yeah yeah um because he his his team goes into a final four and plays a university of kentucky team that up to that point was undefeated and looked almost unstoppable mm -hmm. um the 1976 indiana university legacy was at risk and i think a lot i, mean, I was one that said you know what it it is it was a great run 40 mm -hmm. years is a good run for a record yeah and something happened that night that you know kind of befuddled some people but when you kind of look at it upon further analysis it made a lot more sense because for as much as we think well wisconsin is an outlier and they are in many respects especially with the rankings versus um the rankings versus results conversation mm -hmm. you had you, you had a team where wisconsin played at a, you know both teams played at a slow tempo both were under 65 possessions per kempom yeah. so that's your first part of this so they both were very deliberate Kentucky was not a great shooting team, but it was still, it was a 35% from three, but they were ranked in the, in the fourth quartile, the lower 25% of teams yeah. shooting three point shots. I mean, they, they were shooting less than 30% of their shots were from the arc from beyond the arc. Yeah. Wisconsin was playing very slow offensively, but forcing teams to take the long twos, which pack line defense, which is a staple of Wisconsin basketball, that pack well, line. I'm sure Indiana fans remember that term. <laughs> We've heard that one before. And <laughs> It, 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 turns probably out, takes, you, it probably takes at least more than four years to learn to do it well. It 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 does, and I mean, maybe Dick and Dick and Tony Bennett can 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 tell you a little more about it. And we <laughs> why Tony never got on here, but <laughs> I think we we look at that seventy six that that you know when you think about the seventy six legacy and just thinking, well, it's going to be UK versus Duke. They're the two best teams in the country. Yep. And Wisconsin kind of said, "Not so fast," as our old as as our old football coach would say, "Not so fast, my friend." Yeah. And it's this sort of, okay, well, what happened? Well, you actually had on that Wisconsin team. You know, Kentucky sent eight guys from them from their team to the NBA. Mm -hmm. Wisconsin sent four, and mm -hmm. the way that Wisconsin used them, they had great three point shooting that they could hit. They had a guy in Frank Kaminsky who could who could stretch a floor. He was a matchup nightmare for for any for any program. Mm -hmm. But there were but then you get into the game itself, and you can again you can catch this on YouTube also. Just type in you know if you if you have two hours to kill, yeah. you know watch this or just heck kill a half hour and just watch the last ten minutes because Wisconsin is coming out of timeouts with great actions. And UK, you can tell, you can see one of the Harrison brothers shaking off John Calipari. Mm -hmm. And at that point, they were relying so much on talent. And it was talent without experience and talent without chemistry. Exactly. And so Wisconsin had competitive talent. They had comp, you know, in some respects, comparable talent in many ways. Yeah. But it's kind of like, it's like every once in a while, and we'll be watching another Olympics here in the summer, you know, watch Olympic basketball sometimes, and especially the U.S. the U.S. team early on, mm -hmm. when they struggle against a team that may only have half their guys in the NBA, and they're not really all-stars, and they're really giving the United States a really good basketball game, because they're great players, mm -hmm. all of them are playing professionally, while whereas the United States may have a lot of really good NBA players, all stars, or maybe a, a step below all star level, but because they've had 
multiple years working together in a unit because that that Wisconsin team were seniors and a few juniors. Yeah. And Kentucky at that point was all freshmen and sophomores. All freshmen, yeah, exactly. And um, they just didn't have that chemistry and working through those things. So that experience, that's coaching. Yeah. And that's not the dog jog Calipari because the man's in the Hall of Fame for a reason. Um, the man's really, you know, he he knew, I think his experience in the international game, as Coach K's experience in the international game, really kind of let him ru- try this model the way that he's trying it. And he may still find a way to win with it as time goes on. I think Eric Musselman down in Arkansas can kind of point to a similar thing too with the transfers, yeah, yeah. that it could work for them. Yeah. But um, so much just, of this comes, go ahead. It's really, yeah, what you're saying, it's really hard to win even with a great coach to win with um, guys that have only been there together for a certain period of time, but also particularly if they're 18 years old versus 21 year olds. You're talking college bodies versus high school bodies. You're talking college maturity, you know, two, three, four years, understanding how the game is and understanding how the world is. Many of these guys, yeah, they go on the road with their parents on it to AAU tournaments, but it's not the same thing as being on your own, on your own Mm -hmm. for, three months, four months, and then now you're in a college basketball season. And you're working probably harder at the game than you've ever worked before. And you throw the last part of this in, which is you've gone most of your life being the the best player on the court. Mm-hmm. And for the first time, you really aren't the, for the best player on the court. You're not the best player on your team where you've been used to being that maybe from, again, for most of your career, especially if you find yourself, you know, if, with a division one scholarship, you're you, oftentimes you're one, you're, you're, you're the top dude. Um, and, and that kind of, kind of points to you're learning how to play in a system that isn't necessarily built around you, but that you're kind of inserted in. And, um, Dean Smith, who's again, one of the guys, when you talk about guys, I would read, I mean, I have the, the, it's up there on the bookshelf, um, multiple offenses and defenses by Dean Smith is one of the, it's, it's one of the, it's the, 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 the the sacred texts of coaching, I think. (laughs) With a forward by Bob Knight, I might add, and yeah, and, and, were, and, and, yeah, two, and and a lot of it, you know, the, the the some of the concepts are a little dated, based before the uh, three point before the three point line, before the shot clock was in the college game. Um, but what you found with this is that he talks at the outset of the book about systems, system coaches versus flexible coaches, mm-hmm. and you look at what a system coach is, and and I think it's actually harder to do this now, but a system is actually a system coach is a guy that says. Much like at Wisconsin, we run we, we run pack line defenses. We run the mover blocker offense. Yeah. We're, we we find players to come into this type of system to play this type of basketball, and that's where we're looking at. Or you look at the Kentucky team that we were talking about earlier that 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 you know in that, in the nineties, the mid nineties, that was designed for defense. It was designed to create offense out of their defense. Yeah, with off the field, ball pressure, ball pressure, high numbers of turnovers. And over time, skills develop. Now, instead of having one or two guys on the floor that can handle the ball effectively, now you have to have almost you have to have all five to be able to handle the basketball and be able to handle that pressure. Yeah. And that you know, the Tobacco Road Scrolls, you know, kind of kind of say, okay, so what if you're a system coach like a Greg Gard has or or Tony Bennett at at at, at Virginia? Or even a guy like Shaka Smart up at uh, at Marquette. A lot of the it can be offensive, defensive, or both. But then there's also something said about that flexibility because as you start bringing rosters together and you look at a good example of a flexible coach, you look at a guy like uh, Matt Painter who yeah. has found different ways to run offense and defense based on having to hide certain deficiencies mm-hmm. or those you know, using that flexibility. And all coaches have elements of both in them, don't get me wrong, but it's that flexible versus system coaching that – you know, I think sometimes can turn players on or off based on you know, on their recruitments. Well, they just go through the post, or mm-hmm. they just or or they they you know, they play too slow, or I don't like their yeah. style of play. They don't take enough yeah. threes, or yeah, they, they don't, don't take enough pace threes. Enough, yeah. Well, and that, and again, a lot of it sometimes you know, as a coach, you know what your team's strengths and what their weaknesses are. If yeah. you've got guys who are not who are good catch and shoot three point shooters, you're going to divine actions and even inside your system create opportunities for that to be the case. You may not run stagger screens for guys who are not really good off screens. You may, you may not, you know, you're not going to put them into dribble jump shot situations who, if they're not, if they're, if they're not really capable of doing that all that effectively. And, 
and that's, I think, something that, you know, we start looking at that system versus flexible coaching model. And you're seeing more and more coaches, I think, adopting that flexible model, much like Mike Krzyzewski, who was a longtime system coach, starts playing zone uh, yeah. a few years back when he had when he had two high level NBA bigs. Yeah. And. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think the, the lesson from all this is, you know, the, like you said, like with the systems can overcome a certain level of uh, sort of talent disparity. And yeah, even from my end, like, you know, even though I didn't like, you know, invest as much time as you did in like uh, reviewing a lot of like the coaching manuals, I may read some of the coaching stuff, but not really like, you know, quite like what you do. But even from my angle, like for recruiting, from just looking at the recruiting numbers, there's plenty of teams out there that, in the past that have like recruited well numerically, but didn't really hit that high of a, a note compared to other teams. Uh, I think like one example is used like Pat Kennedy at, at, at DePaul, you know, Pat Kennedy was the, the Florida state coach back in the nineties. Like IU faced them in the, the tournament. He, he was coached for, uh, you know, Sam Cassell and all the, and Bob Sur and all those really good early FSU teams. He took the DePaul, job in like 98 had a, like a crazy good class like quentin richardson lance williams bobby simmons like all top 25 kids i think the best season he had was like 21 wins and i think he got bounced out of the first round um in the tournament against like uh, kansas i think so yeah i think the yeah the, the, the summary i guess is that the talent can explain up to a certain point but then there's this whole other like realm that talent simply cannot, you know, explain where coaching and systems like really do um, account for the other portion of that. So I think, you know, in our conversations always kind of go like this is like, I, I say like, I can explain this team up to this point. And then it's like, okay, Bob, you know and what you tell me about like exactly what you think this team is doing in terms of maximizing, you know, what they've got. And so, and, and, and so we can look at, you know, let's just, you know, we'll talk about Indiana for a minute and what Indiana seems to be wanting to do both on the court, but also on the recruiting trail. And again, coaches have types of players. You know, I think sometimes, and I think sometimes when we're when we're having this conversation across the board, it's like, well, the rankings tell you one thing, but not every kid's going to be a good fit with the type with the type of coach. Yeah. And if it were as easy as designing a good practice and and drawing up some little squiggles on a whiteboard, anybody can do this. But you got to be able to work with people, and particularly eighteen to twenty two year old. 23, 24 year old kids now in some cases. And I, I think that, you know, what it means for an Indiana university under Mike Woodson, I think Woodson has definitely made it, made, made it, made it clear that he has a type of player that he wants. And I think a lot of it's based on that on length. I think, I think he's big on length. I think he's big on wingspan. I think he's big on being able to defend at a certain level. And this team hasn't really shown that yet. It's coming. He was wanting, I think, to run a fairly complex help side. We talk about nail slot rim all the time and whether it's yes, no. But I think he's looking for guys that would fit that system. And I think in so many ways, he it's like, well, if we have three point shooters, we'll shoot the three ball. But he, you know, you can see you could just tell he's almost hostile in press conference. Anybody who questions him as to analytics, anybody who questions him in those areas, because he has the sort of guys, and I think he has the sort of mindset that he wants to run. Knowing that he wants he wants five guys who can push in transition. He wants five guys who can get the ball off the off, out on a rebound and get it out quickly up and down the floor to try to get an offenses faster. I think he wants to run simple, you know, simple sets that get guys into scoring positions, you know, within maybe within one rotation of the basketball. He's not trying to wear a defense down, he's trying to beat a defense down the floor. And or an offense down or, uh, he's, uh, and uh, with his offense trying to do that. And I mean, can he get buy-in from kids is always the question because I think the one area we always talk about, and we saw it again against Kansas last yesterday, talking about the Auburn game, and really talking about IU since the era we were there just before that, it's getting high-level guard and wing play and getting it not just two, not just one, not just two. And this is true of the Big Ten Conference, really. It's about how, can you get those high-performing guards with with some experience, especially in the sweet, you know, the, 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 those the, those guys, can you get them on your in your program playing for you? 
Yeah. And that I think is something that, you know, he's very choosy about who he's wanting to bring in. Yeah. And so to me, there's a calculus there, which is, okay, he wants guys that are going to be able to play basketball the way that he wants them to play. Good, bad, or indifferent. And that's a conversation we can have and we will have over mm-hmm. the, oh, you know, and not just you and I, but we're going to have it on whatever form, whatever, wherever we are. But I think that that whole idea of he's going to be a certain way because he's wired a certain way as a coach and he's not going to second guess himself is important for us to kind of keep in mind as we're going through the next, through the, through, through, through however long the tenure is. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it comes down to, he wants, you know, he'll find a way if he needs to play two, if he needs to play two stretch fours, he'll find a way to play two stretch fours. If he needs to find, if he, you know, he, if he, if he's looking for maybe a taller off guard, that's not a great driver. He's going to look for that taller guard that's not a great driver because especially if he gives him that 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 area on the de- on the defensive end, he's getting what he wants there, exactly. uh, and and that's I think that that's I I think it's something that you know whatever happens inside a program, that's that's a key part of this, which is Tony Bennett definitely has has kids that he that that he will say he'll take hard passes on. We see Matt Painter take hard passes on one and done kids from the state of Indiana. And we've seen our, we, we we've seen other coaches take passes. We saw Mike Woodson take passes on multiple kids, maybe not full passes, but they haven't really put as much into recruiting them as some fans would like to see. And a lot of that I think comes down to who they you know who they're looking for, what they're looking for, and not just their physical attributes, but also as they get to know them in the relationship on the recruiting trail, yeah. how they're going to mesh with what they have available. Exactly, I, I definitely think Woodson is one of those coaches that looks for talent and fit. And so some coaches are not that picky about fit and others are. And uh, I think it's pretty clear that uh, Woodson is definitely uh, more on the extreme end of like wanting guys that look a very specific way and have a certain sort of um, uh, toolkit, you know, available to them. So speaking of tobacco road, when we come back from break, we'll talk about a fateful trip down tobacco road. So stay tuned on the Back Home Network. All right. Welcome back to Exes and Joes. I'm Mike Weymouth, joined by Coach Bob Motes. Our last segment, uh, the story of an ill-fated trip down Tobacco Road. Bob, you got a chance to uh, go see IU play in the first round of the uh, NCAA tournament in Winston-Salem against Colorado in 97. Is that right? Yeah. So it was the same year, the same team, same season we were talking about in the Mm -hmm. athletic department. So, you know, calls my office and says, Hey, you want to, do you want two tickets? And you know, they're like 25 bucks a piece. And I'm just saying, yeah, I'll go. And I asked about 25 people. It was right before spring break started. So everybody else had plans. I even asked you and you're like, yeah, what did I say? Do you remember? Don't go. Whatever you do, (laughs) don't do this. And it's like, why? Well, it's just not going to be a very pleasant result for you. I'm like, Ugh. and you weren't even talking about the drive down, which was rough enough. But um, what I can say is they got out there and it was another, it was one of those, those games where, again, I think I lost by, 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 by 20. Yeah. Chauncey Billups absolutely shredded the Hoosiers with about 30 points because they had no one that could guard them. They looked completely lethargic, completely out of it. Nothing was really seeming to work. It was an absolute basketball disaster. And I think at that point, when we were driving, my friend Dishour, John and I went to that game. He was at Ball State at the time mm-hmm. and, you know, where he graduated from. And so we're, and he's a big IU fan too. We we're driving back. And I, I swear to this day, we saw a night because he walked back from the arena there to the hotel. And we were staying at the hotel, same hotel. In a rainstorm, we saw he walked back from that. It was about a two, three mile walk, walking back after that game, just because he had to just, you know, because he was at that amped up. That that would be his first time doing that, by the way. So no. <laughs> and it's like, I don't want to be around these kids. <laughs> it's like, I get it. I get it. Um, but there was an absolute disaster there. And I think what it really what it really kind of pointed to there was okay there is something to what we're talking about more and more. Um, And then I remember a couple weeks later, the final fours in Indianapolis. 
and I went to an op- the open practice. And so, you know, you saw Kentucky doing slam dunks and, you know, put on a show. Same with Arizona, putting on a show. Uh, Minnesota really was just kind of just, just went through some, yeah, but really just nothing, you know, nothing spectacular. But then Dean Smith comes out there in his North Carolina practice t-shirt and a whistle. And he's got him, he's got him running drills and whistles blowing. It's like this, this continuous disciplined approach with dudes with acuity. Mm. And I thought to myself, it, yeah, that these aren't mutually exclusive concepts that, authenticity is what really matters at the end of the day. And whatever you're doing, especially in coaching, especially in program building, you are who you are and you don't shy away from it. And, and so much of this conversation, I think that we've been having and that we're going to continue to have with everybody over the next, you know, however long we do this years is, is that <laughs> I'll, I'll be satisfied if we make it another week. So uh... <laughs> I am me too. I mean, yeah. if I wake up in the morning, it's a win. Um, it's <laughs> It's it's a thing that you know. I think where the where where we where we continuously are just impressed by 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 where the game goes. It's a really narrow landing pad, mm-hmm. and it takes very special people to do it. Yeah, and that special sauce has to be. In, well, could we look back on it? You realize how it happened, but you may not know what's actually happening till you've done it. Yeah. Um. No. Yeah, and I think that's true. Like. You know, like what you say is that, you know, and I've heard you say this before. It's like you know, so much of the the variance between some of these elite teams is sometimes just like one coach has one little set, one little something that just something. that you know, in a, in a two or three or four point you know final four game can be the difference. And so, yeah, I mean, with the talent, you know, we talk about the talent. Like I always tell people that. You know, the talent just gets you into the the rest the into the the wrestling match mm-hmm. like you know you it's like the royal rumble like you know you get to be one of the 12 if you recruit like you know x number of players above top 80 you have like at least six nba you know people on there thing is that there's about at least you know half dozen or more programs that are kind of doing about the same thing or at least in the same zip code so so much of actually what determines you know winning national championships is all the stuff that, you know, I didn't talk about what you did is this all the, um, those coaching variances and all the stuff that, um, yeah, what did Dean Smith do versus what Krzyzewski did or what Krzyzewski did versus Kalapari. So, yeah, I think, yeah, so much of trying to explain this to people in our conversation is that it's an incremental argument. It's that, you know, I can explain the basketball, I can explain, you know, teams and correlations up to a point but beyond that point is stuff that i can't really explain with the stuff that i do and it takes a lot of bob stuff or like stuff about coaching method and theory that explains the rest and you have to and you have to kind of understand that you know coaches are usually pretty miserable for a reason you know at times and i mean that you know tongue-in-cheekish because you always know what's going to go bad and Mm -hmm. and i think you're always preparing for what could go bad well, at the same time, preparing, you know, getting your guys ready to play. But I think the big key is as we, as you look at the net, you know, as you kind of look at a program or you look at how a team is progressing, it's so close. When you think about, you look at, you know, look at a team, look at the margins. And if you're talking six to eight point margins over eight losses, nine losses, that's three to four possessions. Mm-hmm. So in less than a half of basketball's possessions, your season hangs in that balance. And it comes down to shot making. It comes down to it comes down to defensive stops. It comes down to having putting guys in the right position to be successful. And it doesn't always and, and by the way, you may do that. It may not work because the shot may go be a little short, may be a little long. It is what it it, it is what it is. But in so many ways, back to you where, where you take this is you're looking at almost stacking the deck a little bit in the game mm-hmm. that the more cards you have to play, the, 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 the better your chances of success are. And the, also the harder you, you know, the harder you are to scout, because if there's only one or two scores, you're pretty easy to scout. You're pretty easy to deal with. Um, we know what the game plan is, but if you have multiple guys who can do multiple things, it's a whole new ball game. 
And so much of that is where, and I think we're going to talk about this a little bit with coaching tenures in particular. Yeah. Yeah. The, that'll be our next, uh, that'll be our actually next episode. We will be talking about that. Like, you know, what, some of the dynamics behind um, what happens when a coach gets hired. Um, you know, we'll be talking about um, honeymoons, chip stacks, and um, basically how the political capital of, uh, of coaches rises and falls based upon recruiting, winning, and basically all the other sort of performance measures within, um, you know, within their job responsibilities. So Bob, any final thoughts? Just a big thank you to all for, for everyone for listening. A big thank you to the back home network, Jared Morris and the rest of the crew for getting us, for getting us started. We really, we, we were having, a, we had a great time doing this and we're looking to have more good times as, uh, the, as, as, the, as the weeks roll on. Exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm, the same um, kudos to uh, Back Home Network. Yeah, those folks are pretty amazing. Um, they have technological skills that are far beyond anything that Bob and I can possibly understand. So, uh, so big uh, shout out to uh, all those folks. And yeah, I'm, I'm with this episode. Um, yeah, I'm pretty proud that actually we were able to check off so many boxes of what not to do in a podcast. <laughs> You think about like, what, there's no advice manual out there for, you know, first time podcasters where you trauma dump on your own audience. As, so I think um, if we do have an audience remaining for episode two, we promise that there will be far less morosity in that, uh, in that episode. We, we promise it'll be a little bit more light and cheery as far as uh, some of our analysis. It will not be uh, basically dragging IU fans by the neck into having them relive some of their worst uh, uh, sports experiences. So, um, and so that's a wrap for this edition of X's and Joe's. Um, this endless conversation will continue here on the Back Home Network. Be sure to check out all the great BHN content, including Assembly Call, Doing the Work, and Crimson Cast on YouTube and at backhomenetwork.com. Until next time, I'm Mike Weymouth. And I'm Bob Motes. Enjoy the holidays, everybody. Merry Christmas.